All right, let's pick up with where I believe we left off, which is on that's the temp um, page 363 in the 11th edition. If you're working from the 10th edition, it's 428. <clears throat> um, we just on what day was that? Wednesday. We just finished talking about. They're driving along and they see the cotton field with five or six graves fenced in the middle of it. And the grandmother says, look at the graveyard. It's the old family burying ground that, that belonged to the plantation. Okay. And I pointed out how many people are on this trip. Grandmother, son named Bailey, daughter-in-law not named, um, and three children. So there's six in the car. A little bit of foreshadowing on the part of Planner O'Connor. Sorry, I've been up since 3.30. My brain's not awake yet. Um, so John Wesley asked, where's the plantation? Because she mentions, you know, the burying ground belonged to the old plantation. And she says, Don with the wind. Ha ha. Um, let's see. They keep going. I'm going to skip a little bit. And they make their way to... The tower eating establishment and stop to eat. Page 364, 429 on the uh, 10th edition. You see a big sign, try Red Sammy's famous barbecue, none like famous Red Sammy's, Red Sam, the fat boy with the happy laugh, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So they, they stop. Red Sammy's working on a car. It's like a service station, right? But also has food. And they go inside and eat. We get a description of Red Sam's wife, tall, burnt brown woman, hair and eyes lighter than her skin. She takes their order. The children's mother puts a dime in the machine and plays the Tennessee waltz. Okay. And Red Sam's wife brings the food and looks at June Star. Paragraph 30. Ain't she cute? She says. Would you like to come be my little girl? No, I certainly wouldn't, says June Star. Just want to smack this child, right? <clears throat> I wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. And she runs back to the table. The woman, ain't she cute? Now when she first says, ain't she cute, what does she mean? She is cute. I, I assume. What does she mean when she says it the second time? What's an, what is it an example of? Iron. Louder? Iron. Iron. What kind? She's being sarcastic. She means you little brat. Okay. Grandmother, aren't you ashamed? You shouldn't talk like that to strangers, you know? Especially when the strangers are being nice. Stop that. got a real loud ringing in my ear, so I'm my hearing aid, I've got this white noise playing and it's too loud. Um, so, Red Sand comes in and he sits down at a table nearby. You can't win. You can't win. These days you don't know who to trust. Ain't that the truth? Grandmother, People are certainly not nice like they used to be. What does she mean, like they used to be? Back in her day. It's the exact same idea that she was talking about earlier when she saw the little, you know, well, one, when the two children, you know, disparaged Georgia and Tennessee, but also when they saw the little black kid standing in the doorway. They're not nice like they used to be. Back then, when I was a young child, she's saying, everybody behaved properly. Two fellers come in here last week, driving a Chrysler, beat up old car, but it was a good one. Those boys looked all right to me. 
said they worked at the mill. You know, I let them fellers charge the gas they bought. Now, why did I do that? Now, reading this in 2022, we have a different understanding for some of these words than they had in 1953. When he says, I let them charge their gas, he's not talking about, wrong one, I put it on a card. What does he mean? He basically told them what they owe him. Like, like, he's like, all right, you owe me X amount, come back when you have it. Exactly. Come back when you have it, okay? He's saying, he let him start a tab, essentially. All right? Why? Because they looked all right to him. Now, why did I do that? Grandmother says, because you're a good man. What's the title of the short story? A good man is hard to find. Well, she just said, you're a good man. Doesn't seem to be that hard to find him, right? I mean, this is the first place they stopped. So maybe the title's not about Red Sam. Yes, I suppose so. As if you were struck with the animal. He's surprised that she would say that. His wife brings the order out, and she says, it isn't a soul in this green world with God's trust that you can trust. And yet, what did Red Sam do? He trusted those men. What's the implication? Both by what he has said and what she has now said. What has the two fellers not done? They haven't come back and paid. And I don't count nobody out of that. Not nobody, she says, looking at Red Sammy. She's telling us she doesn't trust her husband. Okay. Did you read about that criminal? The misfit that's escaped? The grandmother asks. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't attack this place right here, says the woman, Red Sam's wife. If he hears about it being here, I wouldn't be none surprised to see him. If he hears it's too sick to cash register. Wouldn't be... Notice, she wouldn't be surprised, right? She repeats it three times. That'll do. Go bring these people their Coca-Colas. Finish the order. And then Red Sam gives us the title. A good man is hard to find. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. Now, if we assume for a moment that, that it is set in 1953, when the story is published, what's he suggesting? Everything is getting terrible. Okay. When did World War II end? Anybody? No? We were in 1953, we're... Korean War was just coming to an end. 1945. So World War II has been over for eight years. Most people would say, if you're going to talk about things getting terrible, World War II would be that time period. All right? But he says, thing, everything is getting terrible. He doesn't say everything is terrible. Right? It's progressively getting worse and worse and worse. Why? Mid-1950s America, you know, for a lot of people today, um, don't go there. For a lot of people today, you know, that's the, that's the golden age. That's when, you know, the nuclear family was at its strongest. That's when employment really took off. That's when, you know, all kinds of stuff were happening. All kinds of good stuff, let's say, were happening, you know? I'm going to come back to this in a moment. And then he says, I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. Really? In 1953? I don't even lock my front door. In 2022. Okay. Uh, when I grew up, mid-60s, you know, we would sometimes, if we had a real... Heat wave, you know, like the heat wave that's hitting California now. Northern California is under a really bad heat wave. 
Sacramento, uh, the capital of California, in the Central Valley, is going on 45, I think, straight days of 100 plus degrees. That's kind of unusual. It's not totally out of the um, normal. But when it would be that hot, I'm from the Bay Area, and you know we would have some times where temperature would only drop into the mid to upper 70s at night, we would leave the doors open. Didn't have AC. Just leave the doors open, screen doors, keep the buds out. He's saying, can't even do that anymore. He and the grandmother discuss better times, meaning the good old days. Okay? The old lady said, in her opinion, Europe was entirely to blame for the way things were now. And what that shows us is not much changes, right? Uh, according to President Biden, why is inflation the way it is? He says it's because of Europe. It's because of Russia and Ukraine. Okay? I'll leave it up to you to go determine the truth or falsehood of that statement. She said the way Europe acted, you would think we were made of money. Why? What was the United States doing in 1953? What did it begin doing at the end of 1945? We started help rebuilding Europe. And not just Europe, Japan too. The reason Japan became such an economic powerhouse was because we helped make it an economic powerhouse. We wrote its constitution. We forgave its debt. Germany, we forgave its debt. What was one of the problems with how World War I ended? Uh, Germany got thrown a bomb on them, so they had to pay them. The Treaty of Versailles, you know, if, if this is Germany's face, and this is a pile of dog droppings, we did that to Germany. We said, you're not getting out of this until you pay back to the last penny. It, it you know, really angered them. Was Germany at fault? World War I? Yes, mostly. Who else was at fault? England was at fault. Russia was at fault. God, keep in mind, the monarchs of all those countries, they're all cousins. And they're like, well, I'm not going to do this or so and such. Thing. Yes. I mean, Austria and Hungary started the war, right? Yeah. And Germany was basically just giving the reparations because they, they were the last one left. It started with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, but what was the problem? There were alliances <laughs> that had been set up. And so Archduke Ferdinand was, you know, imagine a bunch of these lined up. He was the domino set these things into action, okay? So, she says, you, you think they think we were made of money because we're spending all this money. Where'd the money come from? Where, where does money come from? Printed. Printing, <laughs> the government treasury, which prints money. Don't go there, Dad. just don't. Um, so, children go outside and play, and they drive off, okay? Everything is getting terrible. Come back to this for a moment. I'm going to try not to spend too much time on this. When the 20th century began, when 1899 turned over to 1900, there was a belief rampant in the Western world that the 20th century would be what? Or would see what? happen in the world, so to speak. Well, we can get an idea of what was thought by the 
um, publication of two new, or the founding of two new publications. One was called The Christian Century. Um, the other one? I think it was. The progressive century. Okay? This one assumed the world would become quote unquote Christian. That doesn't mean, you know, dogmatic Catholic like Flannery O'Connor was, right? It means, you know, the idea of what's called the social gospel, where everybody would treat each other nice and everybody would be good and people would stop being thieves and rapists and pillagers and, you know, things like that. The progressive century. This, you know, like modern day progressive, you know, political ideas. Everything would get better. And that what we would see by the end of the century, we would see the end of world hunger, we would see the end of poverty, we would see the end of war. Now, a war starts in 1914. What was that war called? The war to end all wars. It was also called the Great War. Why? Because it was the first world war. It wasn't called World War World War One until later. Okay. And then what happens less than 20 years after it? We get the Second World War. And then what happens five years after the Second World War? The Korean War. Which we didn't really, we, the United States, didn't really call war. Why? It was a conflict. Congress never declared war. We did World War I, we did World War II. And then, before that decade was even out, the United States was involved where? We weren't openly at war, we weren't shooting, we weren't fighting, but we were involved. Cold War began a little bit earlier. It really begins 1945 with the division of Berlin. Vietnam. Vietnam, okay? The French are involved in what's called Indochina, and we send advisors, and very, very shortly in the sixth decade, the 1960s, we start sending troops over. First JFK, then LBJ, okay? Everything is getting terrible. At the same time as these two publications begin, we have the rise of, we have the beginnings of a branch of philosophy or school of philosophy called existentialism, okay? It's, its father, so to speak, is a Danish theologian named Soren Kierkegaard, right? And his whole thing is, you know, living for the moment is what's important. But for him, that's within the context of God, right? But you have to live for the moment. Why? You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Yesterday doesn't matter, right? Mid-1930s, this idea gets further developed. So this is kind of a, with Kierkegaard, a Christian existentialism. In the 30s and 40s, you get secular slash atheist existentialism. And the two main proponents of that are Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Sartre writes a whole bunch of stuff, essays, philosophical tracts, plays, etc. Probably his most famous play is one called No Exit. And what he means by that is you can't leave. You can't get out of this existence you're stuck in. Yes, you can die, but that's not really an exit. That's what he's saying. Jean-Paul Sartre is pro uh, Albert Camus is famous for novels and plays and such, but also he popularizes what's called the myth of Sisyphus. Anybody know what that myth says or is? Or who Sisyphus was? It's an ancient Greek myth, okay? Sisyphus is a guy who was condemned by the gods for all eternity. He has to push a big old rock up a hill and he gets just to the lip of the top of the hill and the rock rolls back down. And he has to do it again. 
and it rolls back down. What's the point? What's the point of rolling the rock up the hill if it's not going to get to the top? What kind? Of, okay, but what kind of action is that? Yeah, but there's one word that kind of describes that. It's futility. It is utterly futile for him to push that damn rock up the hill. Why? Because it's just going to roll back down. So why does he do it? Because he's forced to by the gods. Camus' point is that is what our lives are. We just don't see the rock. We go about our daily lives and we're just pushing that damn rock. And what's it going to do? It's going to roll back down over us. And we get up the next day and we push our rock. And we get up the next day and we push our rock. What does it say about life then? It Louder? It doesn't, mean it doesn't mean anything. Okay? At almost the same time as Kierkegaard is doing this, and the, these two things are coming into being, a little bit early in the 19th century, another German, okay, Friedrich Nietzsche, who Hitler loved, comes up with the philosophical school, so to speak, of nihilism. He died of insanity, by the way. <laughs> nihilism is like what, you know, we have the word annihilate. What do you do when you annihilate something? You destroy them all. Nihilism exists, says, there's no point. There is no point to existence. We are nothing but insignificant specks. And look at some of the web telescope images that go back farther in time than we've ever seen. And there's utter beauty out there. But what is one of the things those in the Hubble telescope show? The universe is vast, right? It's huge. And as far as we know, not guess, not speculate, not estimate, no. How much life is there in the universe? This is it. We're all alone. Now, some astronomers, physicists, etc., they can't accept that. And so they say, just based on the laws of probability, there's got to be. Because if the universe is that vast, and we're it, and this is your mentality, uh, how did we come to be? Flip of a coin. It was mere chance. Okay? So all of this together builds I mean, World War II, Hitler's motivated by what? Not only the idea of the ubermensch, the overman, the super race, you know, but also this. Okay. Secular atheist existentialism reaches its apex in the 50s and 60s. That is, it has become the dominant world philosophy, kind of world philosophy. The church, so to speak, I don't care what you're talking about, Protestant, Catholic, etc. Even religious belief, okay, is waning. And this mentality is taking over everything. That is probably what is meant. Everything is getting terrible. Okay? Got it. I'm using all that because that is setting up our meeting the character of the misfit. I posted to the content section of D2L today uh, uh, another module or something just titled Flannery O'Connor, and I posted a short file. It's like two or three pages, and it's snippets from some letters that she wrote to um, a woman who wrote to her after she published this story. Okay, and it's a, it's kind of about faith. I don't you don't have to read all of it. You don't have to read any of it. It's not going to show up on a quiz or exam other than maybe in extra credit stuff. But the portions that are in bold print, look at those. Um, unfortunately, your book doesn't include these anymore. Because she talks about 
why she writes the way she does in the mid-1950s. Again, she's thoroughgoing, card-carrying, believing, people ring-kissing Catholic. She, you know, and she says she writes the way she does because she is Christian, not although. So her Christianity is central to everything, right? So the grandmother, they go on, they leave there, and the grandmother tells the kids um, a story about a plantation house, middle of page 365. Outside of Toombsboro, a little bit of foreshadowing again, she recalls an old plantation she had visited in this neighborhood once when she was a young lady. She said the house had six white columns across the front. There's an avenue of oaks leading up to it. Sounds like what? Sounds like Major Despain's house, okay? Or even William Faulkner's house, okay? And she says, and it had a secret compartment that had silver hidden in it. John Wesley, let's go. We'll find it. Come on, Pop. Can't we turn around? June Star, we never have seen a house with a secret panel. Let's go to the house with a secret panel. Come on, Pop, can we? Grandmother, it's not far from here, I know. It won't take over 20 minutes. Bailey's just driving on ahead, jaw as rigid as a horseshoe. What does that mean? His mouth isn't slack, you know, he's grimacing almost. Children start to yell and scream. John Wesley kicks the back of the front seat, which means he's kicking his father in the back. June starts hanging over her mother's shoulder, whining in her ear. Now, you know, here's mom, here's Bailey, June starts here. So she's not just whining in mom's ear, she's also whining in Bailey's ear. Bailey says, all right, would you all shut up? Just shut up. If you don't shut up, we won't go anywhere. It would be very educational for them. Really? How educational would it be? What is she suggesting they literally do? What would this be considered by the law? Breaking and entering. Thank you. This is illegal, right? All right, Bailey says, get this. This is the only time we're going to stop for anything like this. This is the one and only time. How many of you think that's true? You're not going to be doing this. Why? You're, why? Uh, I just think they're probably going to stop for me. Okay. Why else? Because she was easily convinced. What does this tell us about Bailey? If these kids whine and complain enough, he's going to say, okay, we're going to do just... I said, we're going to go, well, okay, we'll do this just one more time. This is like the parent who continually threatens the child, some kind of disciplinary action is going to happen, and never follows through. All right? She says, the dirt road you have to turn down, it's about a mile back. Baby's like a dirt road. Bear in mind, there is no interstate highway system. They're on a state paved road, like 301 or something like that. There's no interstate 75 or 24 or 40 or any of those yet. Bailey, you can't go inside this house. You don't know who lives there. John Wesley, you talk to the owners and we'll sneak around back. Yeah, that's a good way to have what happen. 1950s, middle of nowhere, Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Billy Bob or Bub is going to come, you know. The mother, we'll all stay in the car. So if they're all going to stay in the car, what's the purpose of turning around? So they go onto the dirt road, and the car races roughly along in a swirl of pink dust, telling us what? Notice, we're not told it goes along. It's racing why? What does Bailey want to do? He's trying to make time up. 
We're going to do this as quickly as possible. Okay. Dirt road was hilly. There are sudden washes in it. Why? Heavy rains wash out part of the road. Bailey just doesn't turn up in a minute. I'm going to turn around. Grandma, it's not much farther. And then what popped into her mind? Oops. That wasn't in Georgia. That was in Tennessee. That plantation house she's thinking of. And when she does that, her feet jump, which causes the basket that the cat is in to turn over. The lid comes off. The cat springs, jumps on Bailey's neck and shoulder, claws out. Bailey wrenches the steering wheel, and they go off the road and turn over several times. As soon as the children saw that they could move their arms and legs, they scrambled out of the car, shouting, we've had an accident. Notice the grandmother was curled up under the dashboard. So she got knocked from the back seat to under the dashboard. Why? Didn't have seat belts in 1953. Okay. Horrible thought she had before the accident was that the house she remembered was in Tennessee. Bailey removed the cat from his neck with both hands and flung it out the window against the side of a pine tree. Wham! What's just happened to that cat? Probably dead. Broke its back. It might not be dead, but it will be soon. Okay. The mother, the children's mother, is sitting against the side of the red gutted ditch. Why is the ditch red gutted? Bleeding. Is it because she's bleeding? What color is Georgia clay? It's red. Holding the screaming baby, but she only, only had a cut down her face and a broken shoulder. Only. I'm trying to remember if I posted the audio file, the link to it. Yeah. I did. Now, the way I'm reading this is not the way Flannery O'Connor reads it. For one thing, you know, I'm interrupting an awful lot. Flannery O'Connor reads it straight through. And you can listen to the audio of it. And it's pretty obvious in her reading of it, a lot of this is meant to be funny. Like, you know, she only had a cut on her face and a broken shoulder. I don't know if you've ever broken your shoulder. Several years ago, 2010, I stepped out of my garage, put some trash in the trash can, and there's snow on the ground, and underneath the snow, unbeknownst to me, there was like an inch of ice. And I slipped on the ice and broke my fall with my arm like this. And when I did, I totally severed my rotator cuff. Every tendon that connects the muscles of yeah, connects the muscles to the shoulder ripped completely. And my arm did this, and I was like excruciating pain. Okay, pain like I've never had before, and I've been on fire before, and that's bad pain too. Okay, I could show you my scar. Um, well, I could show you a lot of scars, but we won't go there. So, listen to her reading of it. It's not that long. It's 25, 30 minutes, okay? Children scream again, we've had an accident. June star, but nobody's killed. Notice, said with disappointment as the grandmother limped out of the car. Man, this is an evil child. Like, damn, she's still alive. You can't get rid of her, like the termite grandmother, you know? Her hat still pinned to her head with the broken front brim. Okay. The mother, maybe a car will come along. Maybe somebody will come help us. Because their car is down in the ditch now. I think. Anyways, the grandmother says she believes she's hurt an organ and Bailey's teeth are clattering. And now we're told the road is about 10 feet over them, above them, higher than them. And they can only see top of 367, uh, the tops of the trees on the other side of it. So here's the road, 
Here's the gully they're in. And over here, there are lots of trees, okay? Uh, over here, on this side of the road, there are tall trees. Probably, what kind of trees? We're told. Well, we know the one the cat hits is a pine tree. So, pine trees. So they're sitting here, and from what they can see, they can see green here, green here, more pine trees. Behind the ditch you're sitting in, there are more woods, tall and dark and deep. And they can see, kind of looking down the gulch, they can see off in the distance, the road, the car coming, slowly. Makes its way to them. Coming slowly as if the occupants were, were watching them. I never caught before why else the car is coming slowly until just now. Grandmother stands up, waves both arms. Keep in mind, they're down here. Okay. Car comes on slowly, disappears around a bend, and then finally ends up here. Driver looks down, turns his head, says something to the other two, they get out of the car. One's a fat boy in black trousers, red sweatshirt. The other one moves around on the right side of them. He stands. He's wearing khaki pants, blue striped coat. Blue striped coat. Hmm. Gray hat pulled down, hiding most of his face. Driver gets out of the car. Older man, hair's turning gray. He wears silver rim glasses. He doesn't have on a shirt. He has on blue jeans. He's holding a black hat and a gun. And the other two boys also have guns. Children, we've had an accident. The grandmother kind of feels like she knows who this guy is. He says, uh, good afternoon. I see you all had you a little spill. The man without the shirt. Grandmother, we turned over twice. He corrects her. No, I saw you. Happened once. We've seen it happen. Try that car. See, will it run higher? John Wesley, wonderful little child. What you got that gun for? What you going to do with that gun? He says to the children's mother, Lady, would you mind calling them children to sit down? But you children make me nervous. I want you all to sit down right together where you're at. June Star, what are you telling us what to do for? Behind them, the line of woods gaped like a dark, open mouth. Mm. Bailey, we're in a predicament. We're in, and then the grandmother, if only June Star's wish had come true, right? You're the misfit. She's the one, he, he's the one she was reading about in the newspaper. So when she says, you're the misfit, what has she just signed? Their death certificate. They're now witnesses. If she hadn't recognized them, it's implied it, it would be okay. Yes, but it would, it would have been better for all you ladies if you hadn't recognized me. Bailey turns and yells something to his mother <laughs> that shocked even the children. And she begins to cry. And the misfit reddened. Why? His face turns red. Why? He's ashamed by what Bailey just said to his mother. He probably just let out a string of obscenities that began with, You! <laughs> Lady, don't you get upset. Sometimes a man says things he don't mean. I don't reckon he meant to talk to you that way. You wouldn't shoot a lady, would you? I, I would hate to have to. Listen, I know you're... What? I know you're a good man. You don't look a bit... Oh, here's what she means by a good man. You don't have a bit of common blood. What does she mean by common? Bad? 
What do you, let me ask, what do you mean by bad? I don't know. Whenever I act up, my grandpa says, don't act common. Low. Low born. Like, not middle class, low class. Stokes family level, right? She says, I know you're not like Abner Snopes. Yes, the finest people in the world. God never made a finer woman than my mother. My daddy's heart was pure gold. Okay. And then he says to the other boy, Bobby Lee, watch them children. <laughs> you know they make me nervous. And he looks at the six of them huddled together. And then he looks up at the sky. Ain't a cloud in the sky. Don't see no sun, but don't see no cloud either. So, if they look up and they see trees over here, trees over here, and they don't see the sun or clouds, what color is this? <clears throat> Blue. Do we have any symbolism going on? Notice they've left the road and gone down into something. And now when you look up, you see blue. Or if you look off to the side, you see green. It's like being in a pool. Not a swimming pool, but like a pond or a lake. Okay. You shouldn't call yourself a misfit. I know you're a good man. I can just look at you and tell. Bailey, shh. Everybody shut up and this. And he's squatting in the position of a runner about to take off from the start. Watch a runner get into the starting blocks. I don't mean like a marathoner, because marathoners just stand at the beginning of the race like this. A sprinter gets down in the blocks, you know, three fingers on the ground, ready, body coiled like a spring. What's that telling us about Bailey? If he gets the opportunity, see a mom, see a kids, see a honey, what's he gonna say? Hire him. Take half hour to fix this here, Carl. Will you and Bobby Lee get him and that little boy? You go step over yonder. They, they, they want to talk to you about something. What's the step over yonder? Back up to the car? No. Off into the woods. We're in a terrible predicament. Okay. Literally, he's talking about right here, right now. Figuratively, it is both right here, right now, and it's all of this. It's the things are getting terrible. Okay. Nobody realizes what this is. Bailey saying, I'm the only one smart enough to know. We're about to die. Grandmother reaches up, adjusts her hat brim. So Hiram pulls Bailey up by the arm as if he were assisting an old man. Notice he doesn't tap him on the head with the barrel of the gun to get him. And they walk off towards the woods. And what does Bailey say? Does he give his wife a kiss? Does he give his wife a hug? Does he say, bye, honey. <laughs> See you in heaven. No. He says, I'll be back in a minute, mama. Mama, wait on me. <clears throat> What's this tell us about Bailey? What kind of person is he? Mama's boy. Mama's boy. Notice she lives with him. He's never been out from under her thumb. Grandmother, baby boy. And then she says to the misfit, I know you're a good man. You're not a big guy. He says, nope, I ain't a good man. But I ain't the worst in the world either. My daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sisters. Wow. Because what does that make his mom? Okay. And so he talks about, you know, what his daddy said about him. Grandma, it's okay, maybe baby, Bailey has an extra shirt. He goes, nah, I'm not going to need an extra shirt. Where are they taking him? Notice the children's mother screams. 
the mystery goes on and talks about his father. Grandmother, you could be honest, you could settle down. He said, yep. Somebody's always after you. Who? Who is the somebody always after you? We're going to read a poem later, much later, by Emily Dickinson called Because I Could Not Stop for Death. And it opens, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, He Kindly Stopped for Me. And death is presented like Rhett Butler. Comes in this nice big carriage. Okay. And we're going to need, read another poem to his coy mistress okay, that depicts death as a horseman chasing us. Somebody chasing you all the time. And she says, do you ever pray? He shakes his head. No. Two bullets, two people. Bailey boy. And he says, that's a gospel singer once. Or for a while. He said, done most everything. Been in the armed service, land and sea, blah, blah, blah. Pray, pray, pray. Is she telling him to pray or is she telling herself to pray? He goes on and says, I, I, I wasn't a bad boy, but then I'd done something wrong and I found myself in prison. And I was buried alive. What does he mean? Was he literally buried alive? No, he wasn't. It's figurative. How so? Well, think of this room and shrink it down. Wall right here, wall right here, wall right here, wall right here. Doesn't matter whether the walls are here or there or there. What it means is you're totally separated. You're totally isolated from everybody else. That is one of the central tenets of existentialism. And you can never break outside those walls. You can never, to use the old AT&T commercial, reach out and touch someone. It's one of the ideas behind the language of that commercial is you can break out the walls, outside of the walls, of alienation, right? And she says, maybe they put you in by mistake. No, no, he says they had papers. They, they had proof. No. You must have told them something. Nobody had anything I wanted. He says it was the head doctor, psychiatrist, at the penitentiary who told me, you know, I did something. If you pray, Jesus would help you. That's right. What? What do you mean that's right? Then why doesn't he pray? Well, then why don't you pray? Don't want no help. I'm doing all right by myself. <coughs> Bobby Lee and Hybrid come back, and Bobby Lee's dragging a yellow shirt with parrots on it. That's the shirt Bailey was wearing. Told me that shirt. He says, no, lady, I found out the crime don't matter. You can do one thing, you can do another, kill a man or kick a tire off his car. Because sooner or later, they're going to forget what it was you've done and just be punished for it. Okay? Another central idea of existentialism is this idea of validation or um, authentication. You have to validate your existence. You have to give yourself meaning. How? By doing something. Doesn't matter what. The something you do can be helping a little old lady cross the street. Or it can be pushing her out in front of the oncoming cars. Either way, the world knows you existed. The, the shooter in Memphis the other day. Everybody knows he exists because of what he did. The queen died yesterday. Everybody knows she existed. Period. Okay. What's O'Connor getting at? What does everyone want to know 
about what will happen once they die. That they'll be remembered. That they will have left a mark. Well, what if your existence is quote-unquote insignificant and you haven't left a mark? Watch the Disney film. Anybody know the one I'm thinking of that I can't think of the name? The one set in Mexico? Coco. Coco. Oh, man. Literally made me have chills. Both my parents died of Alzheimer's. Right? In, in Coco, man, I don't want to give this away. Watch the Disney film Coco, and yeah, you'll see the. Old movie. I feel like you talk about it. You'll see the. It's not. No, it's not that old. Five, six years. Um, it's about death, and what happens to you after? Kind of. What happens to you after death if nobody remembers you? Okay. So. She says, when Hiram and Bobby Lee take June Star and John Wesley off to the woods, the grandmother says, um, Jesus, Jesus. And the misfit says, yep, Jesus thrown everything off balance. It was the same case with him as with me, except he hadn't committed any crime. And they could prove I'd committed my crime. Remember the scene of the crucifixion? Jesus is hanging there. And the one thief says, if you're really the Son of God, get yourself down and us too. And the other thief, the one on his right, says, who the hell do you think you are? I mean, we're guilty. We did what they say we did. He didn't do anything. Listen to what he says. That's why I sign myself now. Then you'll know what you've done. You better keep a signature and a copy of what you've done. Then they'll know what you've done. And you can hold up the crime to the punishment. Sisyphus pushing the rock. He's saying, so that what happens to you, you'll know what? There's a reason. Because according to this belief system, there's no reason to anything. It's out of this that what is called... The theater of the absurd rises. And every play within the genre, the theater of the absurd, makes you leave going, what the hell did I just spend an hour or an hour and a half or two hours watching? What was the point? That's the point. There is no point. So go get a weapon and blow your brains out. That's the kind of the point. Because when you, even if you commit suicide, what are you doing? You're making a statement. And the statement is, I'm nothing. So she says, Jesus, you've got good blood. I know you pray, Jesus. I'll give you all the money I got. She says, you know, there never was an undertaker. Never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. Why? Because the undertaker just, you know, strips the body of what's on it. <laughs> now the two children are dead. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, and he shouldn't have done it. He found everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw everything away and follow him. The title, A Good Man is Hard to Find, look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 and following. It's when the rich young guy comes to him and says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus doesn't just say, Oh, we'll do X, Y, Z. He says, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And then he gives him the answer. And I think what Jesus is saying there is, good job. <laughs> you recognize me. You recognize me as God. And then he tells him, go and sell all that you have. Well, follow the law. Yeah, I've done all that. Go and sell all that you have and follow me. And he's like, hmm, darn. Why? Because he's rich. Notice what he says. If he didn't raise the dead, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness. Why? He is saying, okay, the misfit is saying, because if you don't believe there is a Jesus, and you don't believe there's a God, and you don't believe there's a heaven or hell, why not take what you want out of this life? 
even if it belongs to somebody else. You know, so I could start walking around and taking everything. That's his point. Okay. We'll stop there. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on Monday talking about this in the very end, like when he shoots her. Why? Okay. Um, but for Monday, uh, read the material that's assigned for the beginning of drama. There are, there's a quiz up over um, O'Connor that will be live. You can start taking it at noon today. It's not due till Wednesday night. And there's an exam up over all the fiction stuff, okay? That starts at noon today. It won't be due until Thursday night at 11.59. Largely based on the quizzes. There's extra credit on each of those. Have a good weekend. You too. Come on, wake up. Wake up.